Today in the Dan Cave, we take a hard look back at what the hell happened to the Seahawks in the desert and what this week's matchup with San Francisco looks like. Will they bounce back? My answer may surprise you. WSU, UW, and the rest of the Pac-12 get set to open their season tomorrow. And for the Cougs, they may be on the verge of making history. I'll tell you what that's all about. And now that the offseason is officially underway in baseball, the Mariners may have already added a key bullpen piece to their roster. I'll break that down and give you a few names of free agent starting pitchers who may also be in play. And a musical tribute as I mourn the loss of one of the greatest rock and roll bands you've probably never even heard of. A roller coaster of emotions lies ahead in this week's edition of the Dan Cave Podcast. Welcome to the Dan Cave. Here's your host, Dan Vienz. I just can't. I can't hold the pain inside right now. I just can't. It's killing me. News today that Heat, you've heard me talk about him before, great Swedish rock band, has parted ways with Eric Gronwall, their dynamic lead singer. He's moving on to other things to pursue other projects. This is what I'm going to miss about him right here. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, if you uh, are around my age or you grew up listening to, you know, really melodic hard rock in the 80s and 90s, um, these guys do it as well as any of the elite bands of that era. Um, they do it overseas. They've never toured the, the U.S. I discovered these guys about five or six years ago right after Gronwald joined the band. They had a couple albums under their belt with with another singer, and I didn't care for him. Uh but this guy was amazing. They've done four records. Um, at least we have that material, but not sure what he's moving on to, what genre, what style. Um, but I'm going to miss these guys. I had always hoped that they would tour the States because they are, and, and him in particular, he in particular, just extremely dynamic live. Um, and the voice, that range, and he pulls it off live too. This kind of stuff... Like, he's not just a, a product of the studio. He he delivers 100% live. Um, anyway, thanks for uh, humoring me on that. <laughs> let's get let's get uh, let's get on to other things here, um, namely uh, sports. Welcome back. Episode 102 of the Dan K podcast. And it's Friday as I record this. I wanted to do an episode Monday. I wanted to jump right on this but I couldn't. It it doesn't happen very often anymore um, as much as it used to. You know, when, when I was younger, I really, really held my emotions on my sleeve and every single game, whether even even in seasons when the Seahawks weren't expected to do anything and, and even at best might have been able to, to finish around eight and eight, I kind of lived and died with every single game, win or loss. And the losses always hurt me, even when there there was no reasonable expectation they were going to win that game. Um, as I've gotten older and matured and there's other things in life and 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 you realize kind of what's important and what's not and, and you put things in perspective, those really, really emotionally hard losses to deal with are f- fewer and far in between. They're usually postseason games. Um, you know, obviously Super Bowl 49 uh, was one. Um, but he, but even last year, like the final regular season game against the, the 49ers coming up an inch away from having a higher playoff seating, uh, the Green Bay game and and feeling like that game was could have been in our grasp. Um, you know, those take a little while to get over. But Sunday's loss was one of those. It was really tough to take. I was really emotional. I was upset. And, and because it was a Sunday night game, I didn't have any time after it ended to really process it. And so I... I'm not kidding when I say this. I had trouble sleeping Sunday night. 
tossed and turned and then I slept on my neck wrong. I mean, it was just brutal. Um, and so I bounced back Tuesday night and slept in later than I've slept in in a very long time. Here's why that loss was so tough to take. And for me, this was the toughest loss as far as when you put it into context. Toughest loss, I think, since they lost to the Chargers at home in week eight, 2018, um, 25-17. Really tough to take, and here's why. One, because of how important the game was. There were some other kind of subheadings and and more minor storylines, not the least of which was, you know, you have the new kid on the block, you have this Arizona team that's that's rebuilt, and they're feeling good about themselves, and they're the team on the rise, and they're trying to knock off the big boy. I thought it was important to show them that their time hasn't come yet. And that this could be a special season for the Seahawks and they were going to, you know, send a message. But even more so than that, just just what it meant in terms of the NFC West race. But also because, and I think this was the biggest thing, the problems that led to the loss, caused the loss. I'm not sure how fixable they are. You know me, I'm an optimist. I'm the glass half full, silver lining, always looking at best case scenario. When people ask me at, at work, you know, what do you, what do you think of this week's game? I, do you think the Seahawks are going to win? I always say yes. I'm not sure right now as I sit here talking to you how fixable the issues are. First of all, I want to get this out of the way. Russ was bad. It was great in the first half, but overall he was bad. I mean, the first half pick that was almost a pick six, that was as bad a throw as he's had in a long time. Uh, probably his worst overall game when you weigh the good and the bad since that Chargers game. And I went off on him. I was pissed after that game. You may not remember. You have to go all the way back to episode 17 of the podcast. To recap, Chargers came to Seattle week 8, 2018. Hawks were 4-3 and three at the time. They had battled back after starting 0-2 with losses to the Bears and Broncos. We were getting used to Brian Schottenheimer and his play calling. Ultra conservative, cost them the game in Chicago. You remember they had made that, that change. Carroll coming out and saying, well, we need... You know, we need to be more balanced. They battled back, got to four and three, and they were about to face a tough, long stretch where they were going to play the Rams, the 49ers twice, the Packers, Vikings, Chiefs, all in a span of about six, seven weeks. So it was a crucial game at the time, even though it was an AFC matchup, for overall seeding. And did I say San Diego? I keep saying San Diego. The L.A. Chargers. It was their first year as the L.A. Chargers. Um, if you remember that game, Rivers shredded them in the first half. But the defense adjusted. Didn't allow a point in the second half. But Russell was bad. He threw a terrible pick six. So there there are some similarities to this game. Threw a bad pick six. And it was the second one of the season. Threw one against the Bears too. But in the second half, he just missed so many opportunities that we just don't see him miss anymore. He missed Jaron Brown on what would have been a wide open touchdown. That would have given them a lead in the second half. And on, on that same play, he was climbing the pocket. He could have run for 50 yards, but he was very hesitant to run that year, if you remember. That was a year that people thought he was a little heavy, really had lost a step. So that was a bad one. And then on the last play of the game where he forced the throw to David Moore, it was dropped. That would have um, given him a chance. It would have given them a chance to tie the game with a two-point conversion. Um, From the six-yard line, I felt like he he could have run it in for the touchdown. Um. But again, he was hesitant. He just, his decision-making wasn't dialed in then. And this was the last year of his contract. So we knew we were about to head into that territory. And we're talking about $35, $40 million guaranteed. And and I really questioned whether he was worth that at the time. And whether his development had plateaued. And I wasn't sure. And I was really pissed after that game. And let's actually take a listen. I actually said... This 
What I mean is that for this team to get to another Super Bowl, win another Super Bowl, Russell has to get better. And this is a unique thing that we're seeing that other fans of teams that have elite quarterbacks don't have to worry about. Nobody talks about how Tom Brady needs to get better. Nobody talks about how Aaron Rodgers needs to get better. Nobody talks about how Phillip Rivers needs to get better or Matt Ryan needs to get better. They just need pieces around them. That's all the talk is in those markets. Doesn't have a running game. Offensive line's not good enough. Defense needs to get better. Needs another weapon. Russell Wilson's the only quarterback that's ever in the elite quarterback discussion that still makes stupid, dumbass mistakes like he did against the Chargers. And by the time he's up for his next deal, it could be $40 million a year, guaranteed. For a guy whose skill set isn't going to age well, he's already slower than he used to be. He can't escape pressure the way he used to. He thinks he can, though, and that's still part of the problem because he eats too many goddamn sacks and he still doesn't throw the damn ball away and he throws stupid pick sixes and misses open guys far too often. So obviously, much has changed since then. Russ has obviously gotten better, much better. Those issues no longer exist. Um, outside of that, the team's been tailored to him and and hitched their wagon to him. The offense has evolved to fit him. Um, that that pick in the second quarter, the, the Buda Baker pick, was inexcusable, but you're going to have plays like, like that from time to time. And the, the, the last two picks, I really don't necessarily put on him. He was trying to overcome a horrific defensive performance. So I I just wanted to make that clear that I think Russell is beyond the point where we need to be worried about a bad game. This one is on the coaching staff, plain and simple. And specifically, I mean, Pete Carroll and Ken Norton Jr. I don't know, and I don't know if we'll ever know, how much Pete Carroll is involved these days in the game planning on defense and the play calling during the game. I had always assumed, and I've said it on this show, hey, people are being hard on Ken Norton. They're saying he should be fired, this and that. Hey, this is Pete Carroll's defense. I used to say that when Chris Richard was the defensive coordinator as well. I'm not so sure anymore. I don't know. But regardless, if he's if he's ceded control to Nor- to Norton, then it's on him as well. But he also, we know this, is very involved in not the the play in play out selection and and calling of offensive plays. But we know how involved he can get in telling Brian Schottenheimer what he wants to do in any given moment. The game plan was bad. And and this is what gets me. One thing that separated these two teams is late in the game, when the Cardinals recognize that the Seahawks had lost their top three running backs. Carson was out. Carlos Hyde, we didn't know at the time, but he was battling a, a bad hamstring. I'll touch a little bit more on that in a minute. And Travis Homer had exited the game. And one reason that Homer is in so often on third down is because he's really great at blitz pickup and pass protection. And so all that was left was DJ Dallas. And that's an area he really struggles in. And you could tell. And as soon as the Cardinals saw that, it was like a shark sensing blood in the water. They adjusted. And they had adjusted late in the in the second half anyway. Started changing up what they were doing. They started getting more aggressive with Buda Baker and moving him more to the line of scrimmage. But in particular, when they realized Dallas was the guy, they just went after him. I feel like the game plan that Carroll and Norton put together for the Cardinals paid way too much respect to Kyler Murray. That because they were afraid of his ability to scramble, they played an extremely conservative game in the secondary. Lots of zone coverage. I saw one person refer to it today as their, they almost game planned as if they're scared of their own coverage ability. Especially once Shaquille Griffin went out of the game and we had to once again rely on Trey Flowers. 
and they used Shaquille Griff or Shaquem Griffin as a spy for Murray, which I asked him to do on the show. You heard me. So I was happy to see them do that. But the way that they just the lack of man to man coverage and the lack of just changing things up, they don't ever disguise anything. Once Arizona figured out what they were doing, they could adjust offensively to it because they knew the Seahawks weren't going to then adjust again. They just don't seem to do that. There was very little blitzing because they were afraid of Murray sneaking away and breaking off a long run. Never mind the fact he has, he does have some accuracy issues, has been prone to to make some bad decisions throwing the football. But they never even tried to force him into tough situations like that. No variety, no surprise. They're just predictable. I'm wondering if we're reaching a time where Pete Carroll doesn't get the benefit of the doubt anymore. Doesn't get that defensive genius label anymore. We heard all the time back in 12, 13, 14 how basic the Seahawks' defense was. But you can succeed with a basic scheme when you have elite players all over the field. When you have three or your four secondary positions manned by future Hall of Famers, a Hall of Fame middle linebacker, Pro Bowl, all pro level players all along the defensive line, and deep. I mean, Michael Bennett and Cliff Averill were basically coming off the bench that year. So you could get away with it. What we've seen since then is them trying to force players into those same positions and play the same scheme. They asked Tedrick Thompson to play like Earl Thomas. They're expecting Shaquille Griffin to be able to cover in man-to-man like Richard Sherman. And their inability to recognize when someone like Trey Flowers just flat out cannot cover NFL receivers, but yet we're were okay heading into this season, even though they went out and got Quentin Dunbar, and that was a good move to upgrade that position. They knew that Flowers was going to have to play a key role as the third corner. Should have upgraded that. But I, but I, I don't want to get away from my conversation about scheme. When you're shorthanded, when you're outmanned, you're missing some guys. You have to make up for that with some creativity. And I just didn't see any of that. Didn't see any of that. And that manifested itself on offense as well. Because they still could have won that game. They still should have won that game. This that I'm about to touch on is what bothers me the most. And also, never mind, I know a lot of people are talking about the refs, never mind the bad call on the Bobby Wagner unnecessary roughness call when he hit the tight end on the third down play. That was a terrible call. Absolutely brutal call. I haven't seen anything from the league this week if they've taken any accountability for that, but that was on third down, extended a drive that led to a touchdown for the car. That was an inexcusably bad call on the field that couldn't be reviewed. I'm not even talking about the Benson Mayo penalty on the field goal that took three points off the board and ended up turning into seven. That's just a player making a dumb play. That's going to happen. I'm not even talking about the David Moore hold that nullified the Metcalf touchdown that would have been the game winner in overtime because it was a a legitimate hold. It was the right call. I'm talking about with 142 left in the game, Seattle up 34-31, third and two at their own 34. They run Carlos Hyde off right tackle, Stop for no gain. Seattle has to punt. Arizona easily marches down for the tying field goal. We go to overtime. We know what happens then. Here's how that drive went. On first down, Russ scrambled. So they tried to throw the football on first down. Then four straight Carlos Hyde runs. Two up the middle, two off right tackle. None of them over your best player, Dwayne Brown, at left tackle. And and we're talking about a Cardinals team that not only had lost Chandler Jones, but also it had 
had lost a couple other defensive linemen during the game to injury. We now know that Hyde wasn't healthy. That he was battling a, a, a tweaked hamstring. And knowing that a first down there ends the game and that they had just run it three times. They had, they had like I'm talking about, no creativity. They had shown their hand. Arizona had, I don't know, an 80% expectation that they were going to run the football there on that down. And it happened, so they were ready for it. And then what pissed me off even more is Monday in his radio show, Carol said, when asked about that play call, he said, well, it was a play that's traditionally worked for us in the past. When I hear that, you know, you know what that means to me? It means Arizona knew that. It means they'd scouted it, seen it. That was the ball game right there. Because we all knew, I, I'm sure you did, looked around at the people you're watching the game with. We're not going to win this game. Kyler's going to right down the field. I'm, I'm surprised we held him to a field goal. I thought they were going to score and end it. You put the ball in your best player's hands. Russ has shown more of a willingness lately to run the football. And he's so much better at it because he climbs the pocket. He doesn't bail out and do those crazy scrambles anymore. And in this game alone, I think it was our leading rusher. Had 70, 80 yards. It was almost like he was trying to prove to the kid that he could still run. If you throw the football there and you look for something quick, and they had used all three tight ends in that game, I think Hollister, Disley, and Olsen all had catches. They'd be a good quick outlets. Dallas catches the ball well out of the backfield. You run something quick when you know they're bringing the house. Or Russell could, could scramble. Get them on the edge, maybe. Built your entire team around this guy. And then when it's crunch time of a, an excre, extreme, I was, I was thinking excruciating in my head. <laughs> but, but I was trying to say extremely. <laughs> uh, an excruciatingly important game. In an extremely important moment. The player that you've built your entire team around and you put the ball in the hands of your backup running back who's playing on one leg. It's... I mean, they, they've committed to him so much. They essentially sacrificed the quality of their defense. They chose to spend $7 million on Greg Olson this offseason to give Wilson another weapon instead of addressing some glaring needs on defense that we pounded the table about all offseason. So you, then that puts you in these situations more often. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I just, I, I just hate the call there. I really hate the call there. And I just want Carroll to figure it out. He's gotten more aggressive this year. I've talked about it on the show. I love it. He's gone on it, gone for it on fourth down more. It's resulted in some wins. It's had a tangible impact. But in a game like this, in a moment like this, when you know your defense is banged up and hurt and you're going to have trouble stopping the other team, I would have been able to sleep a lot better Sunday night if on that exact same play, they had called for a pass play and Russell couldn't find anyone open, tried to run, got stopped, or pass protection broke down because... Cardinals brought an all-out blitz, and Russ couldn't get rid of the ball quick enough. I'd have been able to sleep better because that was our best chance to win right there. If it had been a healthy Chris Carson in the backfield in that situation, maybe it's a different situation. I'm not saying shouldn't have run there. Throwing the football was the only answer. running the football there with Carlos Hyde on a bad hamstring after three straight Carlos Hyde runs was the wrong call. So that's what pissed me off. And now, now the Seahawks limp literally into a game against a 49er team 
who's pulled themselves up off the mat since that terrible game against the Dolphins a couple of weeks ago. Now they're feeling good about themselves. And we don't have the help of home field. No fans in the stands. So we don't get that usual slight advantage that we get in an important game like this. Doesn't sound like Shaquille Griffin's going to play, so Trey Flowers is going to be on the field again. And Quentin Dunbar is still not 100% healthy. They're, they're managing that knee. There's more to that than we care to know. He didn't practice at all on Wednesday, and they limited him Thursday. Jamal Adams isn't going to play again. Ugo Amadi might not play. Ryan Neal, who's played so well in Jamal Adams' stead, limited in practice this week. Benson Mayoa hasn't practiced at all. He might not play. And we're not getting pressure even with Benson May- Mayoa. He's been terrible. 49ers also banged up on defense, but a very, very good offensive line. They've been running the ball well, but they're down to their fourth and fifth running backs. I'm prepared for a loss this week. It's rare when I take that mindset. But I am prepared for a Seahawks loss. Easier said than done on Friday. I, I may be just as mad Sunday, depending on how uh, how we arrive at that loss, if it happens. Again, it's rare when I feel this way. But it's hard not to feel that way. And so I want to get you ready as well. Because it just doesn't seem like a great matchup on paper. You know, unless unless Russell goes out there and, and puts 45 points on the board. Because this defense is still just going to be really shorthanded. And when you add that to the fact that I just don't like the way they're calling games, it's tough. It's going to be tough to overcome, at least for now. Hope is on the horizon. So, to get you ready, as I said, if the Seahawks were to lose this week, the NFC West is just a mad, mad dash. The Seahawks would drop to 5-2. and two. The 49ers would improve to 5-3. and three. The Rams play the Dolphins to a Tagliavoa's first ever start. So let's assume that they win to move to 6-2. and two. So they'd be in first place now. The Rams, who we kind of wrote off a couple of weeks ago. Cardinals are, are on a bye, so they'd be 5-2. and two. So every team in the division would have two or three losses and five or six wins. Talk about a mad dash, right? And the advantage that could have been gained. That's why that game was so important. If you just convert on that play, come away from that game with all the same injuries. Side note, I would have won my fantasy game also. But that's beside the point. You would have had that one game lead even if you dropped the game this week because you're so banged up. It was a huge loss. Huge loss. We may be looking back on that one later and really, really lamenting it. It could be a difference maker. Um, Now, back to the optimism side of things. Can they overcome it? Sure. You know, you find a way to beat the 49ers on Sunday. You know, like I said, they're they're banged up on offense too. That offensive line is great, and and or, or I don't know about great. They're very very good, and I don't think we're going to be able to get any pressure on Garoppolo. And Shanahan's a master at kind of manipulating things side to side, and it would have to be a shootout. And Russell will have to bounce back and be great, and and that's very likely to happen at this stage of his career. The Russell Wilson that exists and lives and breathes in 2020. I don't expect. To have two bad games again. I expect him to be very, very good on Sunday. And another area he's gotten better in, he really wore that loss. He put it on himself, even though I think he's wrong. He didn't always do that early in his career. He didn't blame anyone else. He just kind of deflected blame in this very subtle way. He's really grown up in a lot of ways. So I expect him to be great on Sunday. Will it be enough? It could be. Because win that game and then everything changes. Now they're back to having it be a 
what, a half game lead, I guess, over the Rams who haven't had their bye yet. I expect to see him on fire on Sunday. But for me, and, and another reason that I'm kind of trying to prepare myself and, and assuming this as a loss on Sunday, it still puts them in better position than they've been in the last three, four years, where week seven or eight, they're a game or two or three games behind the leader trying to catch up in the division. So I guess you could make the argument they could afford a bad loss. They were going to take one eventually. But I see, for me, the real season for Seattle, barring any other major injuries that happen this Sunday, that's always a factor. But it really starts the following week. Not because it's in Buffalo, which is an interesting matchup in its own right. But because that may be the first time that we get the defense back to being whole or as whole as they can be now. Obviously, Blair and Irvin, some of those guys lost for the season. Assuming that Jamal Adams can get back next week. He was supposed to practice on Wednesday, didn't, and then they added illness to his designation. He's not on the COVID-19 list, but just wasn't ready. I'd rather wait an extra game or two and get him back 100%. So assuming he comes back for Buffalo and that we would get Shaquille Griffin back out of concussion protocol also. Seahawks made a big move this week and they added Carlos Dunlap. I didn't see this coming because they just don't have any draft capital. I didn't realize how cheap Dunlap would come. Seahawks were able to turn B.J. Finney and his seventh-round pick into Carlos Dunlap. Y'all should be familiar with Dunlap at this point in his career. 11 years in Cincinnati, 82 and a half sacks. He was, he's been remarkably consistent. Since 2013, no fewer than seven and a half sacks. If you look at his stat line year by year, it's seven and a half, eight, nine, eight, seven, nine. He had his high of 13 and a half in 2015. Only one this year fell out of favor with the coaching staff. Snap counts the last couple of weeks have been extremely low. But the last two years combined, even as a 30-year-old player, 17 sacks, 24 quarterback knockdowns, and 28 quarterback hurries. His pro football focus grade for 2019 was 89.7. That's outstanding. That's like elite level. That's like J.J. Watt territory. Nick Bosa this year, before he got hurt, was at 84.9. Benson Mayoa was at 72.8 this year. Just Or no, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. 52.1 this year, just for reference. His best year ever was 72.8. So Carlos Dunlap, especially now, motivated. Everything I read about this guy, great in the locker room, despite the fact that he was not happy with management and coaching, wanted out. Sounds like an absolutely ideal change of scenery, bounce back candidate. Happy to be out of there. Carroll says he's going to use him at the Leo position, just let him turn his turn himself loose, loose on the quarterback, and that'll, that'll keep L.J. Collier, and when he eventually comes back, Rasheen Green, who started practicing this week, he can come back in a couple of weeks to man the five-tech spot. Mayoa will become a rotational piece, and really there's a chance that he becomes a very deep bench piece, and as other guys come back and get healthy, uh, Benson Mayo's roster spot may not even be safe for the remainder of this season. This has not been good. Carlos Dunlap for a seventh round pick and BJ Finney, who hadn't played a snap yet and didn't turn out as well as they expected. Um, outstanding move. And his contract situation for next year, I think his cap hit would be 13, 14 million, if I recall. None of that's guaranteed. Um, if this works, this could be a two- to three-year, this could be a Dwayne Brown situation. You bring in a good veteran near the end of his career, and he finishes his, his career there. Certainly, if he still has something left in the tank, and there's every indication that he does, 6'6", 285, crazy long arms. If, 
if he does, if it works, it would make sense for the two sides to work something out. Maybe do maybe tear that contract up, do a two year deal, keep him here. Certainly from the Seahawks standpoint, it'd be easy to recruit a guy like Dunbar. Like, hey, oh, you like it here? Wait till you see it with a full stadium playing on defense. So this could be more than just a stopgap half year or two thirds of a year rental. Potentially a really, really great move. Something that had to happen. If they hadn't made any move before the trade deadline, which is next week, I I think I would drop my expectations of this team from a 12 to 13 win team down to down to maybe a 10 win team. That's how bad the defense has been. And I held out hope. You, you heard me on the show being optimistic, but man, a lot of that went by the wayside for me on Sunday in Arizona. But there are other reasons to believe that things could really get started in earnest when Dunlap is ready to play. We could start seeing some of that this week. They get a boost. All indications are Damon Harrison, Snacks Harrison, is going to finally play. Been with the team for three weeks now. They haven't officially elevated him from the practice squad. That's expected to happen. Against a team like the 49ers that loves to set things up by running the football, that could really be a boost. So you start to look ahead to what this defense could be when you add Dunlap to it. With Snacks Harrison next to Jaron Reed on the interior. LJ Collier, who I think in his second year has really been one of the bright spots and really improved. And, and I think we we're, we all should be feeling better about what we're seeing from him. And then you have to like what you saw from Jordan Brooks in his first start since coming back from the knee injury against the Cardinals. He was flying around the field, hitting guys. We saw him covering tight ends 25 yards down the field. Remember when he was drafted, some of the draft experts didn't like him because they said he couldn't cover. Well, they just didn't watch all this tape. They only watched his senior tape when they didn't ask him to cover. Jordan Brooks looked like a player. And then we didn't see much from Alton Robinson on Sunday because they played Shaquem Griffin in a role where he could spy on Murray. But he's going to get an opportunity on Sunday with Mayoa out. I assure you those sirens are not coming for me. With Mayoa out and Dunlap not ready to play yet, has to pass through the COVID-19 uh, the protocols. That's why he wasn't eligible this week. Alton Robinson has a chance to really shine this week. And so you start to think about now building some layers of depth with Dunlap at the Leo, Robinson spelling him, Mayoa as your third guy. Snacks Harrison in the middle there, getting Adams back. Having Jordan Brooks on a game-in, game-out basis. Now you start to think, okay, as long as Trey Flowers doesn't have to see the field very often, maybe this defense can be just good enough to help the offense win some games. I'll say this, though. I hope the Seahawks aren't done. A couple days left until the, the real trade deadline, even though you know if they make a deal before the deadline, that player wouldn't be able to play until the following week. Um, there's rumors out there of guys being available. Tack McKinley of Atlanta, I, I think as a former first-round pick, as a kind of a resurrection candidate, uh, he would normally make sense. I don't know if they have the draft capital, capital to do it without a third. Uh, Ryan Kerrigan, you might be able to get for a fifth, but are you going to are you going to sacrifice your entire draft next year? It'd be challenging with the money. And with the compensation, but if there's a way to make one more move like that, make it happen. Or how about a corner? And then finally, what's uh, I don't know, what's the deal with Clay Matthews? I thought when Irvin got hurt, they had met with him. He has the history with Pete Carroll. He was effective last year as a rotational piece for the Rams. I think he had seven or eight sacks. Still had something left in the tank. I think he could be in some ways a perfect complementary piece as a situational pass rusher. Give the defense a spark. Really has an intensity that would, that would, that would add to that side of the ball. Um, it could just be a situation where the guy just doesn't want to play. The guy really doesn't want to play unless someone's going to pay him a, a significant amount of money. And the Seahawks obviously wouldn't be in a position to do that. So I think especially now with Dunlap and how in his game, man, if there's a way you could get Clay Matthews in there, uh, that'd be a nice little piece. Um, and, and then I think 
can we all agree what the priorities look like for next offseason? Is there any question what they look like for next offseason? And I'm not talking about like free agency. You know, you want to keep Jamal Adams long term, even though Quandre Diggs hasn't played as well as we hoped this year. Um, you'd like to keep him longer. You got to make a decision on your cornerbacks. Um, those those I kind of keep on a separate on a separate page, right? I'm talking about the draft. Draft assets are limited as they are or not. It's corner and defensive line. It has to be clear as day with each passing game. We'll get into more detail on that obviously as the season progresses. But I just want to throw that out there. That's just clear crystal clear as it could possibly be. We have college football. We've had college football, but we have Pac-12 college football this week. Um, That excites me. (laughs) UW and WSU both kick off their 2020 season this Saturday. Uh, The Huskies are at Cal. Cougars are at Oregon State. Both games are at 7.30. Oh, side note, I, I hope to heavens that the reports of Larry Scott being out as Pac-12 commissioner after this season are true. Um, why, after you wait this long, would you have the Huskies and Cougars both playing 730 games? I, I just It's just terrible. Anyway, as the Cougs get set to play Oregon State, first of all, on, on, a, grand, on a grand scale, I have zero win-loss expectations for the Cougs this year. Transitional year from Mike Leach to Nick Rolovich. Whole new schemes, whole new techniques. I was reading the other day about how the offensive line has had to completely relearn their sets and their and their combo blocking because, it, you know, the air raid wide splits they've played with and, and had drilled into them in the last couple of years. Those are gone. So just a lot of transition. So I'm not expecting anything win-loss-wise. I just want to see how the schemes work and how the young players progress. They're going to be playing a lot of freshmen. But we still don't know who the starting quarterback's going to be tomorrow. I told you a couple of weeks ago that I I hoped it wasn't Jaden Delora, the six foot, one hundred seventy five uh, five pound four star recruit, true freshman from Hawaii. But he just may be the guy, and I may have been wrong. The more I think about it, uh, it's it it essentially. St- is pretty obvious, it seems, that it's down to he and Cam and Cooper, the four-star recruit out of Utah a couple years ago that we expected to be the starting quarterback two years ago as a freshman, heard great things about him, and then a guy named Gardner Minshew came in as a transfer and took the job and ran with it. And then the next year, Anthony Gordon rightly won the job, had a great season. Uh, Cooper has struggled. He was... Cougs have had two scrimmages. Cooper was okay in the first scrimmage. He was terrible on Saturday in the second scrimmage. Threw two pick sixes. Delora was the better player in both scrimmages. 10 out of 14 for 133 yards, including a 55-yard touchdown pass, and ran for a touchdown in the first scrimmage. In the second scrimmage, 10 out of 13 for only 49 yards, so he was definitely dinking and dunking. But over the two scrimmages, a 71% Completion percentage, and he added another rushing touchdown. Even Max Borgie, their star running back, said on the record he has played the best of the quarterbacks. Gunnar Cruz seems to be a distant third. Familiarity with the offense may give him an edge. He played in the run and shoot in high school. Rolovich recruited him to Hawaii for that reason. He's familiar with the scheme for Cooper and Cruz. This is a massive scheme change. You always heard about the air raid, how simplistic it was, how there wasn't even a playbook, how there were just a couple of den, a couple of basic plays. They just ran them out of different formations to different sides. So the learning curve may really be kind of weighing down Cooper and Cruz. The reason I didn't want Delora to start was I saw this as a transitional year that really didn't matter as far as the standings go. Just let, let's get ready for 2021. And so I wanted to preserve his red shirt and his eligibility. Um, I'm not so sure. Because he might be the type of dynamic talent that can really elevate a program and a new coaching staff. And so why not use a season that really doesn't matter 
to get him ready for 2021. So that then maybe this team can really start to do something. It'll be interesting to see. Um, By all accounts, WSU has never started a true freshman quarterback. At least not in the opener. No one's been able to dig back through the records and find any case of that happening. Probably won't know until just before the game tomorrow. But we could be talking about uh, true freshman quarterback starting for Nick Rolovich and the Cougs um, next week. If that happens, I would expect... Uh, in the offseason, either Cooper or Cruz, or maybe both, to enter the transfer portal. Um, but Rolovich also said that he expects to play more than one quarterback, too. He did it last year at Hawaii, uh, even though Cole McDonald uh, ended up being drafted. He still, uh, I forget the name of the second guy, but he had four starts, and so he did go back and forth. He will have a quick hook, I think. We'll see. Uh, speaking of being competitive in 2021, let's talk about the Mariners to finish up. Um, World Series, Dodgers beat the Rays in six games. I uh, was really pulling for the Rays. Um, they were a lot of fun to watch. And as I as I pointed out in the last episode, they, they kind of are a model to look at for how the Mariners are trying to build their team. But the offseason is, is here now. It's upon us. I mean, it happens that quickly in baseball. It's not like football. Free agents literally can sign with teams as of Sunday. And we know Jerry DePoto doesn't like to wait. If there's a deal he likes, he'll go make it. And so we might have some things to talk about soon. Um, Although I think we all believe that this offseason is going to be more about some free agent signings instead of any big trades involving their young talent. I think, think, you know, they want to go with their young group and see what they have. They've already made some decisions on the 40-man, clearing some spots there. I was a little frustrated to see Taylor Gilbo lost uh, to waivers. I think the Rangers picked him up. But last week, we talked about Kendall Graveman. This week, the Mariners made the move. First, they released him, and then they resigned him the next day. He loves the situation here. And furthermore, when I talked about him last week, I talked about him as, as, hey, DePoto says he wants to add three to four established, really good bullpen arms this year because he thinks that's the difference in contending potentially and not. Well, this is the first piece. Kendall Graveman has a chance to be a really legitimate, important piece of that bullpen. I don't know if he's a closer. He may get a shot at it. But he'll pitch in high leverage situations. When he moved to the bullpen last year after he came back from the neck thing, his velocity ticked up. He was good. And he looked good in spurts even before the injury. But remember, he was coming back off missing a full season of Tommy John. This is a guy that was the opening day starter for the A's in back-to-back seasons before he hurt his elbow. And he comes in, it's basically he can make the same amount of money. It was a $3.5 million option. They declined it, waived him, signed him the next day. He can still make the 3.5. They just basically restructured it so it had a lower base and some incentives. But I get excited about this move, not just because I talked about it, but because of how excited Graveman is. He talked at length about how much he loves the situation here. He confirmed he will be moving permanently to the bullpen. He's going to change his training regimen. He's going to approach this offseason differently to make that transition and prepare to pitch in relief. I think this is a really good move to get a guy that could uh, really make an impact and also um, at a a reasonable cost. Um, And even Graveman said he he echoed exactly what DePoto has said that he believes a good bullpen can make this team a playoff contender. So what next? We've added one piece. What next? What about Brad Hand? This was not a name that we expected to talk about. I named some bullpen guys a couple episodes ago that could make sense. Uh, The Indians waived their closer. He had a $10 million option. The Indians are cutting costs. If he goes unclaimed, they'll decline the option and pay him a $1 million buyout. But he's probably going to be claimed. 
Um, I believe the Mariners would be 10th in position to make a claim. I think it's the same as draft order. Could be wrong. If he gets to them, should they claim him? I mean, $10 million with their current payroll structure is a lot. Could that be more than they were willing to pay for a closer? Maybe. But did they expect someone like Brad Hand to become available? Probably not. With Graveman already in the fold, um, you know you've got one spot filled at a very reasonable cost. Hand could give them a guy they weren't expecting to be available, as I said, in his prime, still effective. He was outstanding again in 2020. And they could get that guy without giving up any talent, just money. And here's the important part. To get a guy without having to bid against other teams. If there's an arm or two that they view out there as potentially their closer, they may have a dollar figure attached to that guy. But we don't know what the competition is going to be. That that price could be driven up. You could claim Brad Hand and know that it'll cost you $10 million. Um, it's, it's interesting. And then if things don't work out, you're not in the race at the deadline, he'd be a prime trade candidate if he pitches well in the first half. Um, in 2020, a 1.35 FIP led the league with 16 saves. He had zero blown saves. Um, 103 career saves since 2017, which is when he became a full-time closer. So keep an eye on the Brad hand situation. Should clear itself up by Monday or Tuesday, I would think. I think it only takes like 48 hours to get through waivers. I don't know how the weekend affects that. Um, so we should know soon. Um, I want to talk about starting pitchers, though, because I didn't think going into this offseason that the Mariners would be looking to add a starter. That rotation was really good, really promising, and you got to make room for Logan Gilbert this year. And um, some other guys kind of stepped up and established themselves. But it sounds like they may be in the market for an established veteran to add to that mix. They're not going to play at the top in the market, the Tanaka top of the market. But I, I wanted to throw some names out there at guys that might make sense, similar to what I did with the bullpen, that that come at a at a reasonable cost, but who may add something to the group that's already in place. The first name I want to throw out there is Trevor Bauer. I think that's where a lot of people are going to go to because he has the local connections. Um, he's part of the driveline group in Kent. Uh, I believe he even owns... I haven't been able to verify this, but Rick Riz said on the air when he was pitching against the Mariners uh, last year in a game that he owns a home in Maple Valley um, that he at least lives in part-time while he's doing work at driveline. Um, he's very much into the, the analytical side of um, pitching development. And so he would seem to align with, with how the Mariners view pitching development as well. Uh, he has stated on the record that he only wants to sign one-year deals from here on out so he can always pick his situation. Made $17.5 million last year. Spot track uh, puts his market value at $22 million. I don't know if the Mariners are ready to go there yet. If, if they wanted to, though, he's coming off an outstanding 2020. 2019, he wasn't very good. But 2020, he was great. 100 strikeouts in 73 innings at 1.73 ERA. Um... A, I don't know if they're willing to go to $22 million on a starting pitcher right now. Maybe if he was the guy, if they knew, if they were coming off a year like they think 2021 is going to be, where they challenged for a playoff spot and, and some of the young guys developed exactly how they had hoped and they thought they were maybe a dynamic veteran starting pitcher away from a World Series, then maybe a move like this makes sense. But the other reason I don't think it makes sense is I don't know that you want his personality in your clubhouse right now. Because this this clubhouse, they've done such a good job of bringing all these young players together and, and, and having a lot of the homegrown guys come up together. It's the first time we've seen this in a long, long time with the Mariners, where these guys have been able to establish a camaraderie and a family and a culture. And leaders have kind of been established or are in the process of being established. 
We haven't even seen what a Jared Kellenick can do and what he can inject into this clubhouse. And everything we hear about him is Jim Rat, super intense. A little bit of Jay Buhner in him. Do you want to disrupt that with a really outspoken, strong-minded, controversial veteran player? I don't know. Again, if the clubhouse is established, we're talking two or three years from now, you're on the verge of a World Series, one missing piece left, maybe you can take a guy like that. I don't think he makes sense right now. So let's kind of look down the list a little bit at guys who would be a reasonable cost but could give you a good performance. And we'll start with Taiwan Walker. He could very well be back again. It was, it was interesting when they traded him to Toronto, DePoto said on the record, we love the guy. This deal made sense for us, though. It gives him a chance to pitch in the playoffs, and we'd love to have him back. In fact, he was so emphatic about that, I thought maybe he he was tiptoeing over the line of potentially um, uh, potentially getting in trouble a little bit. Um, but Taiwan Walker could be back. He pitched well for Toronto after the trade, and he showed he can stay healthy. He would make sense, and we could see him again. Um Corey Kluber is a name that I think a lot of people will gravitate to. The two-time Cy Young winner. Um, only pitched in one game for Texas last year. It's expected that they will um, decline his option, buy him out. He'll become a free agent, or it may have already happened. He only pitched in one game, and then he tore a muscle in his shoulder. He is said to be healthy and that he expects to be able to have a normal offseason and prepare for a healthy 2021. He's 34 now. Is he worth the risk? And what would he cost? Those are obviously the big questions. If a Corey Kluber was healthy and interested in joining a young team like the Mariners to kind of steady that rotation, and if you like what was going on here, sure. I think there's too much risk there, though. I think the Mariners would be looking for someone who would be a little bit more reliable. Kevin Gossman is another one, the former high draft pick. Um really resurrected his reputation with a good year in San Francisco, enters free agency at 29 years old, used to be known as a high-velocity, high fastball usage strikeout pitcher, changed his pitch mix last year, uh, threw the changeup a lot more, 79 strikeouts in 59 innings, made $9 million last year. He could be a guy that makes sense. And another one that I like is... is, uh, Anthony DiScalfani of the Cincinnati Reds. 2019, he was really good. 9-9, and 9, 3.9 ERA, struck out 9 per 9 innings. Had a down year in 2020. He was a little banged up early on. Long ball was a nemesis of his. He was left off the playoff rotation. Still just 30 years old. Wouldn't cost a lot of money. Could be a good solid bounce back candidate. Um, I like that as another name to keep an eye on as well. And again, free agents can start signing with teams uh, on Sunday. So we could start seeing some movement very soon. Uh, Before we go, just a reminder, the um, 365 Sportscast Network set to launch in January. The website is now up. You can check it out. It's 365sportscast.com. Go check it out. It's got the schedule in there. You can see where my show is set to debut. Uh, The Emerald City Sportscast will be Wednesdays at 11 o'clock Pacific time. 2 o'clock Eastern, starting in January. We will have an official launch date as we get closer to it. Also, I want to say this. On the verge of the most important week we've all had in many, many years, regardless of what your politics are, and if you read my Twitter feed or uh, follow me on Facebook, um, you probably know what my politics are. I'm sure you do. But that aside, this is a crucial time in our society. This is a crucial time in our history. What happens next week will likely shape our future, at least the direction of this country, and have a dramatic effect on all our lives. No matter what side you're on, vote. If you haven't voted already, do it now. Don't wait until the last minute on Tuesday. Make your vote count. I already... We dropped ours off a week ago. I tracked them yesterday. They've been counted already. Make your vote count. The vote in 2016 was historically low. And this is the point I want to make. 
I just want to make sure I just want everyone to vote so that no matter how it turns out, we can say that at least it represents what the country really wants. I'm not saying the opponent in 2016 was any better. But we don't know. We'll never know if it was truly what the country wanted because nobody voted. So get your vote in now. Do it. Next week, we take a full look at how the NFC West race shapes up. We break down the Seahawks 49ers battle. We look ahead to a really interesting Week 9 game in Buffalo. We'll have a Pac-12 college football weekend to dissect. We'll look at how Nick Rolovich and Jimmy Lake fared in their respective debuts for the Cougs and Huskies. And we may have more Mariners moves to talk about as well as the offseason is now upon us. Follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. You can email the show at thedancaveshow at gmail.com. Check out the 365sportscast.com website. And until next week, go Seahawks, go Mariners, and go Cougs. Thanks for listening.